Almighty God, you are the Lord and giver of all good things. Every good gift comes from you above. Give to us good thoughts, good discipline towards your holiness and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're on page 206 of Dr. Millard Erickson's Christian theology. We're talking about inspiration. Now we turn to the theories of inspiration. A number of views have arisen regarding the nature of inspiration. Brief survey will help us to see the ways in which they've been worked out. The intuition theory makes inspiration largely a degree of insight. Some within left-wing liberalism. What is left-wing liberalism? Holds such a view. Inspiration is the functioning of a high gift, perhaps like an artistic ability, but nonetheless a natural endowment. A permanent possession, which they dogmatically assert or dogmatically presuppose or dogmatically desire, arguing in a circle. Scripture writers are religious geniuses. The Hebrew people had a particular gift for the religious, just as some groups have a special aptitude for languages and mathematics. On this basis, the inspiration was essentially no different from any other great religious thinkers such as Plato, Buddha, and others. The Bible is great religious literature reflecting the experiences of the Hebrew people. Studied by James Martineau. Study of Religion, Oxford, Clarendon Press, 1889. Two, the Illumination Theory. If there was an influence of the Holy Spirit upon the authors, but it involves only a heightening of their normal powers. So it's basically a modification of the first point. There's no special communication of truth nor guidance in what is written, but merely increased sensitivity and perceptivity with regard to spiritual matters. It is not unlike the effect of stimulants taken by students to heighten our awareness or amplify the mental process. Thus, the work of inspiration is only in degree and not in kind. But the spirits work with all believers. The result of this type of inspiration is increased ability to discover the truth. The dynamic theory emphasizes the combination of divine and human elements in the process and of the writing. The work of the spirit is in directing the writer's thoughts or concepts he should have and allowing the writer's own distinctive personality to come into play in the choice of words and expressions. Thus, the person writing will give expression to the divinely directed thoughts in a way that is uniquely characteristic of him. For example, this was the view he cites as belonging to Augustus H. Strong. The verbal theory insists that the influence of the spirit extends beyond the direction of thoughts, the selection of words used to convey the message. The work of the Holy Spirit is so intense that each word is the exact word which God wants used at that time to express his message. Ordinarily great care is taken to insist that this is not dictation, however. James Packer, Fundamentalism and the Word of God. And then number five, the dictation theory. The teaching that God actually dictated the Bible to the writers passages where the spirit is depicted as telling the author precisely what to write or regarded as applying to the whole Bible. <clears throat> this means that there is no distinctive style attributive, attributable to the different authors of the book. That's an overstatement. The number of people who actually hold this view is considerably smaller than the number to whom it is attributed. 
since most adherents of the verbal view take great pains to di distance themselves from the dictation of theorists. There are, however, some who would accept this designation of themselves. John Rice, our God-breathed book, Rice accepts the term dictation but expresses, yet disavows the expression mechanical dictation. Although John Calvin and other reformers use the expression dictation when describing inspiration, it seems unlikely they meant what is actually denoted by the term John Calvin in his commentary on 2 Timothy 3.16, the law and prophets are not a doctrine delivered according to the will and pleasures of men, but dictated by the Holy Spirit. Now we move on to the method of formulating a theory of inspiration. We must, before continuing further, examine two basic methods of formulating a theory of inspiration. The first method represented, for example, the writings of B.B. Warfield and the Princeton School of Theology that took inspiration from him and from Charles and A. A. Hodge places its primary emphasis upon what the biblical writers actually say about the Bible and the view of it which is expressed in the new way that they use it. Footnote 8, Benjamin Warfield, Biblical Idea of Inspiration. The second approach is to look at the, what the Bible is like to analyze the various ways in which the writers report events to compare parallel accounts. This characterizes the method of Dewey Beagle, scripture, tradition, and infallibility. The method used in constructing the doctrine of inspiration should parallel the method used to formulate other doctrines respect to the question of the sanctification of the believer, the first method would emphasize the didactic biblical passages which describe and define sanctification. The second approach would look at actual cases of Christians and try to determine what sanctification actually produced in their lives. This approach would use biblical instances, narrative and description, as well as historical and contemporary biographies of Christians. Regarding the question of perfection, the first method would look like what Paul and other scripture writers teach as doctrine on the second subject. The second method would examine whether act Christians actually display a life of perfection. If the issue is whether Jesus was sinless in his life on, on earth, the former method would consult didactic doctrinal passages such as Hebrews 4.15. The latter approach would examine the narrative account of Jesus' life and would ask whether his cursing of the fig tree, his casting of the money changers out of the temple, his denunciation of the scribes and Pharisees, his behavior in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night of his betrayal and other similar actions were really the actions of a sinless person, or whether they should rather be interpreted as instances of petulance, anger, and fear, which in an ordinary human would be termed sin. With respect to the doctrines just enumerated, the approach in this volume and of most theologians who emphasize the supreme authority of the Bible is to place the major emphasis upon the didactic material and make the phenomena secondary. Thus, the latter will be interpreted in the light of the former. Any good systematic theologian will be consistent with regard to the method that he uses. Thus, our major basis for the didactic doctrine of scripture will be the didactic material. The actual phenomena of scripture will be used to help determine the meaning of the didactic material. A 
parallel example is the doctrine of Jesus without sin. Passages like Hebrews 4.15 establish the doctrine. The narratives of Jesus' life help to understand just what is consistent and what is excluded in the concept of sinlessness. Both aspects are needed, but one must carry greater emphasis consistency of theological methodology beginning with the teachings rather than the phenomena. The teachings will give us the formal nature of the doctrine, while the phenomena help fill out the content. A few words need to be said about the difference between biblical teaching about scripture and the phenomena which illuminate the nature of scripture. There is considerable confusion about these two matters. By the former we mean the doctrine held by Jesus and the disciples and other bi biblical authors about the nature of the Bible. With respect to the degree of inspiration or intensiveness of inspiration, the doctrine is not usually stated explicitly, but can often be inferred from what they said about the scriptures or how they regarded what the scriptures taught. Jesus and the apostles regarded the scripture as authoritative because they believed God had directed the biblical writer. What he wrote was what God said, that they regarded even the minutest details as binding, indicate that they felt that inspiration by God extended even to the smallest particulars. The phenomena, on the other hand, concern what the scriptures are actually like rather than what the authors thought about their own or anyone else's writing. Here we become engaged in comparing parallel passages, evaluating the degree of accuracy of the writings and similar activities. Note carefully the distinction between didactic material and phenomena in the following example which pertains to the doctrine of sanctification and perseverance. That John Mark deserted Paul and Barnabas and later returned to usefulness is a phenomena in what Mark did, which may shed light on these doctrines. Paul's official position on this is part of the didactic material. That Paul was reconciled with Mark and received him back although it makes no explicit comment on sanctification and perseverance, it enables us to infer something about them. In this particular case, we derive our knowledge of both phenomena, Mark returned to usefulness, and Paul's teaching, inferred from the fact that Paul once again found Mark useful from Paul's writing, 2 Timothy 4.11. Nevertheless, there is a logical distinction between the phenomena and the didactic material. This distinction should be carefully kept in mind, especially when we are investigating the nature of Scripture. In that case, the topic of investigation is also the source of the didactic material. So we've moved from that to the extent of inspiration. We must now pose the question of the extent of inspiration, or to put it somewhat differently, let me just check ahead here. <clears throat> what is inspired? Is it the whole of the Bible or certain portions? One easy solution is to cite 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable. There is a problem, however, in that there is ambiguity in the first part of the verse. The text reads simply posse grafe, theropnusas kai ophelimos. It lacks the copula esti. Should the verb be inserted between grafi and theopnustas? that case, the sentence would literally say, all scripture is God-breathed and profitable, or should the copula be placed after the In that event, the 
next sentence would read, all God breathed scripture is all is profitable. If the former is adopted, the inspiration of all scripture would be affirmed. If the latter, the sentence would emphasize the profitability of all God breathed scripture. From the context, however, one cannot really determine what Paul intended to convey. What does appear from the context is that Paul had in mind a body of definitive writings known to Timothy from his childhood. It is unlikely that Paul was attempting to make a distinction between inspired and uninspired scripture within this body of writings. Can we find additional help on this issue and two other texts previously cited? Second Peter 1 19 21 and John 10 34 to 35. The first glance this seems not to succeed since the former refers specifically to prophecy and the latter to the law. It appears from Luke 24, 25, 4 to 25 to 5, 27, that Moses and all the prophets equals all of the scriptures. And from Luke 24 to 45, that Moses, or the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms equals the scriptures. In John 10, 34, Jesus refers to the law. He actually quotes from Psalm 82, 6. John 15, 25, he refers to a clause found in Psalm 35, 19, a word that was written in their law. Matthew 13, 35, he refers to what was spoken by the prophet, and then quotes from Psalm 78, 2. Moreover, Paul refers to a number of different types of passages, law. Isaiah 28, 11 to 12, and 1 Corinthians 14, 21. Psalms in Isaiah, Romans 3, 19, and even Genesis 16, 15, and 21, 9, which are narrative passages, Galatians 4, 21 to 22. Peter refers to the prophetic word, 2 Peter 1, 19, and every prophecy of Scripture in such a way to lead us to believe that the whole of the collection of writings commonly accepted in his day was in view. <laughs> it appears that law and prophecy were often used to designate the whole of sacred scriptures. Can this understanding of inspiration be extended to cover the books of the New Testament as well? This problem is not so easily solved we do have some indications of belief that these writers were doing was of the same nature as what the writers of the Old Testament had done. One explicit reference is to the New Testament author to the writings of another, 2 Peter 3.16. Here Peter refers to the writings of Paul and alludes to the difficulty of understanding some things in them. She says, the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do other scriptures. As Peter groups Paul's writings with other books, prefer, pro, presumably familiar to the prophets, which were regarded as scripture. Moreover, John identified what he was doing with God's word. We are of God. Whoever knows God listens to us. And he who is not of God does not listen to us. We know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. First John 4, 6. <clears throat> he makes his words the standard of measurement. In addition, the entire book of Revelation contains indications of John's consciousness of being commanded to write. Revelation 22, 18 and 19, he speaks of the punishment upon anyone who adds to or subtracts from what has been written in the book of prophecy. The expression used here is similar to the warning, which appears three times 
in the Old Testament canonical writings, Deuteronomy 4, 2, 12, 32, and Proverbs 30, verse 6. All wrote that the gospel received by the Thessalonians had come by the Holy Spirit and had been accepted them for what it really was, the Word of God, 213. Well, the question of what books should be included in the New Testament canon is another matter. It should be clear that these New Testament writers regarded Scripture as being extended from the prophetic period to their own time. Another question which must be addressed is whether this inspiration was of a specific action of the Holy Spirit at particular times or a permanent possession by virtue of who the writers were. To put it differently, was this an intermittent or continuous activity of the Holy Spirit? As noted earlier, one position attaches inspiration to the prophetic office or apostolic office, per se. Paul Schwann's Christian apology. According to this view, when Jesus commissioned the apostles to be his representatives, he gave them authority to divine and teach truth. Those who hold this view ordinarily cite Jesus' commission of the twelve apostles in Matthew 16, 17 to 20, in which he gave to Peter the keys of the kingdom, noting that Peter had just said, said to him, by the Heavenly Father, not by flesh and blood. The commission of Matthew 28, 19 and 20, and the promises of his Holy Spirit guiding and teaching and illuminating ministry, John 14 through 16, are also regarded as substantiating this view. Inspiration by the Holy Spirit is, according to this position, virtually equivalent to being filled the Holy Spirit. Whenever a prophet or apostle proclaims a Christian message, he will, by virtue of his office and through the Holy Spirit, be speaking the truth. But can this view of inspiration be squared with the data of Scripture? It appears rather that the power to prophesy was not constant. In Ezekiel 29, 1, for instance, there is a very precise dating this case down to the exact day as to when the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel, saying, is true of the coming of the word of God to John the Baptist, Luke 3, 1 and 2. It was also precise dating in the case of Elizabeth and Zechariah, Luke 1, 41, 42, 59 to 79. Further, some who were not prophets prophesied, Balaam, Numbers 22, Saul, 1 Samuel 19, 23, 24. The intermittent character was true of other supernatural gifts, the ability to speak in languages not previously learned came suddenly upon the apostles, Acts 2, 4, and there's no indication they continued to practice this gift. In Acts 19, 11, and 12, we read, that God performed extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, but there's no indication that this was a regular occurrence. It is logical to suppose that the inspiration for the writing of Scripture was intermittent as well. Finally, we note that there were times when the apostles seemed to stray from what God was God's word for them, from the practice of spiritual truth. Peter certainly was compromised by withdrawing from eating with the Gentiles when certain Jews came, Galatians 2, 11 and 12. Paul found it necessary to correct Peter publicly. Paul himself was hardly blameless, however. One of the great church fights of all time took place between him and Barnabas, Acts 15, 38 to 41. Contention between them became so severe that they found it necessary to separate from one another. Although we are not able to determine the nature and extent of fault in this situation, it does appear that Paul was at least partially 
in error. The objection that these men strayed in their actions, not their teaching, does not really cut, carry much cogency, since teaching is done as much by modeling as by proclamation. From the foregoing conclusion must be drawn that inspiration was not permanent and continuous matter tied inseparably to the office of prophet and apostle. While it may have been operative at times other than the precise moment of the writing of scripture, it certainly did not extend to all of the author's utterances and writings. Here we'll draw it to a close. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and Holy Ghost.